go ahead and turn to the 25th chapter of the book of Exodus. And uh, we uh, kind of slim tonight, but that's okay. We, Lord knows we'll be here, so he, he's, uh, he's got who he needs there, I guess. And uh, glad well, to see all of you tonight. Tell everybody that she's still under the weather a little bit. Oh, no. Sister Shirley. Yeah, she's, uh, she's got some bad sinus infections. She's supposed to have got some antibiotics. I assume she did. She didn't go to the doctor. She didn't go to the doctor. Uh, I'm going to go by there and take her to the doctor again. Yeah. She told me she was going to go the next day after I talked to her. Yes, yes, yes. When her company left. Yeah. Anyway. Of course, she told me, but she told me this lady she didn't do it. Yeah. Let's go ahead and, and uh, start off with what a, chapter? A chapter 25 of Exodus. Chapter 25, page. Uh, uh, can you see it? 145. <laughs> That's one feet. Page 136. Let's go ahead and begin uh, with a word of prayer. Brother Sam, would you lead us, please? I thought I'd come for you from a gracious end to do. Thank you once again for being able to come together, to believe and worship you. The Lord, Brother Gary, opens up your word this evening as we read your your word, the study, it, just ask you to help us to be able to lead some truth from your word. Lord, you know the ones that are not here this evening, the ones that are physically down in health, not able to be here. We just ask you to touch and heal bodies according to your will. And Lord, for those that maybe just sense sick, cold, and indifferent, just have lost interest in coming to church, we just ask that you might be merciful unto them to still touch their hearts. <coughs> and I realize that it's important for being faithful to you. Bless the service now for your story failure in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hey, brother, yeah, I was going to tell you, I talked to Mike Lee yesterday. You know he's been coming. And he's uh, he had that COVID, and he was real sick. And he's doing way better now. He said that he, okay. he thinks he would be okay to come, but he said he's going to skip this Sunday and start turning back next Sunday. Okay. And we saw Todd, too. Yeah, Todd's doing better, too. He's anxious to get back. Well, he told me that he called me last Wednesday and asked could he come, and then he told me that he had an outstanding COVID test that he wouldn't get the results back till Friday, so I asked him to wait till he got the results back before he came because that, that didn't go over well the first time that happened, but uh, he said that... Uh, he said, by faith, I'll see you Sunday, so I didn't see him Sunday. The day before yesterday, he hadn't got his... His COVID test back. Okay. So he hadn't got back yet. But, but, but he's, we'll by Sunday. he's hoping to be back Sunday. Todd uh, uh, Luba. Who was that? Todd Luba. He is a young man that's been coming here on uh, Sundays and Wednesdays, and his dad's the one that died. Uh, uh, he's been coming our Sunday school class. Yeah. He drives that motorcycle. He drives drive the motorcycle. Bald headed. You remember him? Yeah. You remember him? He ain't exactly bald headed. He just you're, got all the hair off. See if you remember him. <laughs> I'm bald headed. I'm bald headed and I didn't cut my hair off. It just fell out. My dad we, let's get on with this lesson right here. <laughs> Exodus chapter 25. If I could get somebody to read for me the first seven verses, please. That's 26? Of 25. 25. I can do it. I think. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering. <coughs> and every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my, my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold, silver, and brass, and blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine linen, and goat's hair. The ram's skins dyed red, and the badger skins, and the sheet of wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil, and for sweet incense. Two or through seven. Through seven. Onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod, ephod and in the breastplate. All right, so is it unusual for God to t uh, tell us or, or put it in our hearts or, or tell us to give an offering? Is it unusual? No. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. God understands that there's a need in His church. He understands that if you're going to have a, a tabernacle, 
temple and, and it's got to be built and, it, and he gives the, what he wants it made out of, then he knows that you got to have the materials and you got to have the financing to be able to get this stuff. And so uh, he, he did ask them uh, for, for an offering. And look in verse 2 where it says, he said, every man that giveth it, listen to this, willingly with his heart. So that he, he's telling us, I, I want people to give, but I, I want them to give willingly and I want them to give it from their heart. And if they're not going to do that, now let me let me go ahead and drop this in there. If you don't if you don't give to the Lord willingly and from your heart, He don't want it. Amen. You don't recognize it. It, it. it don't do you any good. You can get the receipt for paying your tithes every year and deduct it on your income tax and do all that stuff. But if you're not giving that from a willing heart, then it's not doing you any good except for a tax write-off. Amen. Now, people who give of a willing heart, they're, they're, they have treasure stored up in heaven. I never, uh, I told y'all that I very rarely ever preach, and I don't ever preach on tithing, but every once in a while I do bring it up because it's something because the Lord does ask us to give. And we do need to be able to give. And, and, and I have searched the scripture over, and of course I'm still finding out new stuff all the time, but I never find anywhere in the Bible where we are commanded to actually pay a tithe. Amen. Now, so in Malachi, where Malachi said that the people of that day were robbing God because they weren't paying their tithes. And so it's it kind of a double-edged sword, but the first person to pay, pay tithes, to my knowledge, is Abraham. He was not commanded to do so. He just did it. And so uh, we, we need to understand that it's not that, uh, that you give, it's, uh, it's the attitude you give with. Amen. That's why Jesus could look at, at, the, at the offering pot and, and be amazed that a woman put two pennies in there, or two pence in there, and he said she's given more than all of them. He not only knew that she didn't have it to give, but he saw her heart and the way she gave it, and it meant more to him than everybody dropping lots of money in there. Amen? So God don't look at things the way we do. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 uh, verses 6 and 7. Let me read you what the what, what uh, Paul told the Corinthians. He said, As it is written, he hath dispersed the broad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness, righteousness remaineth forever. That is the absolute wrong scripture. Uh, chapter uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. I started on 9. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. In other words, if you don't put much into something, you ain't gonna get much out of it. And that don't that don't really just mean money. It means anything you do. You get out of something according to the effort you put into it. Amen. Yeah, that don't change. That's, that, that applies to everything in our lives, not just to godly things. And he says also, he says, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Now listen to this next verse. Every man according as he purposed purposes in his heart so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity amen not grudgingly nor us of necessity for God loves a cheerful giver amen he don't want you to even feel obligated that you got to give amen that's what he said. I don't want you to feel like you out of necessity have to give me anything. Why? He owns all of it anyway. <clears throat> Amen? He owns it all. It's all his. Can I say one? Yes, sir. Jump in. If you give with the right intentions, the right heart, it will build your faith. Sure. Because you will see what he can do for you if you're not expecting it. If you give with the right heart, if that makes sense. Amen. Amen. It will build your faith. Amen. And, and let me give you a story that just made my heart zoom. And how many of y'all know Brother Maxie that works at the meat market in, at Brookshire's? Well, there's, there's a bunch of young men that work there at Brookshire's, and he's taken on 
the responsibility of, of training these young men up in the way they should go. Because he's a Christian man, he's a preacher. And he's taking it on, his role is to take these young teenage boys, and little, some of them a little older, and presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. He told me, so I got them all going to church. Well, when the COVID stuff hit, they started uh, backing off on their hours, some, and, and not being able to pay them a lot. He had just got a few of these, these young men to start giving them the offerings and, and, and paying their tithes and doing those things. And one of them came up to him and he said, he said, I'm not hardly getting anything this week. I'm not hardly getting paid anything. And he said, uh, I'm just not going to be able to, to give any money to, to the church this week. And he asked Brother Max, he said, what do, you, what do you think I ought to do? He said, that's not up to me to tell you what you ought to do. What you need to do is ask God what he wants you to do. And uh, he didn't talk to him about it anymore. And he said the next week, he come running up to me so excited. And he said, uh, you know, Brother Max, you always told me I can't outgive God. He said, last week, when I asked you about whether or not to, to give money or not out of what little I made, I decided to give it. And he said, I got a bonus check this week. And I give God the glory. Amen? Y'all, you can't out give God. God don't want you to go hungry. He don't want you to not pay your bills. He don't want you to have to do without to give to Him. But if you do it with the right heart, He appreciates it. And he, he'll, give you, he'll, 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 he'll lift you up for it. Amen? Amen. Go ahead. I was just trying to do like you was talking about and picture some of that in my head. and It is a perfect example because they didn't work for this gold and silver. They walked out of Egypt with it. That's right. God handed it to them and told him he would. Yeah. They'd do it to start with. So he was testing a little greed there. These probably people probably never had a dollar to their name. Yeah. And they got all this gold that God just gave them. Yeah. The, the Egyptians begged them to take it and leave. Yeah. And he's, he's seeing if they'll give it back. And you know what? We get confused sometimes thinking, well, I worked so hard and, and got this, you know. Well, you know, it ain't that way. Yeah. And we have to be careful because if we're not careful, we'll think, well, just think what I can do with this money that I'm giving God every week. We never need to think that way or act that way toward God. If you feel that way, you might well just keep it. Amen. And so he, he did. He said, I want this. I want everybody to give at will. And every man that giveth it willingly and with his heart, he shall, ye shall take my offering. And so he asked people to give him this stuff. And some of this stuff is pretty peculiar stuff if you look at it. Because see, it wasn't about just gold and silver. It was about precious metals. It was about materials. It was about uh, things like badger skin and the color of the badger skin that he wanted particular colors and everything. God had a, 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 a certain look and everything that he was telling them when he, he told these are offerings, by the way, for the tabernacle that they're going to have in the wilderness. And everything that God has placed in this tabernacle has a specific purpose, has a specific reason, and, and has a specific effect because it points to something. Amen? And so everything, every article in this, in this uh, tabernacle is going to point to something that God is going to do and the way He's going to do it. And it tells us some things about Him and who we are in Him. That's what we're going to learn uh, in the coming days and weeks for, about the tabernacle. And so let, let's get started on this. And, and he does ask sometimes for us to give specifically. Amen? Now, we've got this confusion. I'll just drop this in. We're going to move on. That, that, that our giving it always involves money. Is that true? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes our giving involves going. Amen? Right. Our, our giving sometimes involves witnessing what we say, where we go with a specific purpose to glorify the Lord and to help win somebody to His kingdom. It also involves time. Amen? <coughs> well, the most precious thing I, have, I think that we all have, but other than money, I think this is way more precious than money, is our time. 
Amen. And you know what? There's some people that are just always doing, always going, always wanting to, to, to do things for the cause of the Lord. And there's some people that say, well, I just ain't got time to do that. Now, let me ask you a question. You know, and a lot of times, I understand that, that uh, retired people that got more time than working people, they do have more time to do things. Amen? But our time is valuable to God. Amen? It's valuable to God. Not only to do, but to take the time to read and study the Word of God. My number one reason for not studying the Bible more when I was working, I didn't have time. My number one reason for not going and visiting when I was working was I didn't have time. Amen? And so we have to, that's a very precious commodity, gift that God gives us is time, but what's more precious to God is that we are willing with a, with, with, a, with, a, with a giving heart, a willing heart, to give Him that that is so precious to us. And time is one of those things. Amen? Just so, just so you'll know what this is all about. And so He, 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 made, he made arrangements for Him to give everything. Now, we're going to start uh, talking about the instructions for the tabernacle. Somebody read for me. This is going to be a short one, so I know Sam is going to jump on this. Uh, verses 8, eight and 9, please. <laughs> I'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. Okay, I love this scripture right here because this scripture right here says bundles to us. What does God say is His purpose for this tabernacle? That He can dwell among us. So He can dwell among those people. That's been God's desire ever since He created man to, to dwell in the midst of His people. It was his desire when he issued the orders to build the tabernacle so he could dwell in the midst of his people. When Jesus Christ came, he took on the flesh and he dwelt, tabernacled among men. He dwelt among men. He came to us and he's coming back to us. And in the new uh, earth and the new Jerusalem, God is going to come down and dwell with us. I always been the desire of God. I love that, don't you? You know, we always say, I want to go be with Him. He wants to come be with us. Glory. Glory. And so He says, and let them make me a sanctuary. Now what is a sanctuary? Holy it's a holy It's a holy place and it's, and, it, and it's set apart for the workings of God and for us a refuge. Okay? A place for us to go and to be safe. Amen? What did Jesus tell us? I am a strong and mighty tower and the righteous run into me and they are safe. Amen? What He says. And so that He is our sanctuary today. He wanted this sanctuary. I want you to make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among you. According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the Tabernacle, that means the dwelling, the, 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 the tent of dwelling of God. And, and you know what? Later on, it's not just a tabernacle. The tabernacle turns into a what? A temple. So the, the tent of dwelling turns into the house of God. Amen? The dwelling place or the house of God. Jesus didn't deny that. He said, this is my house. And my house is a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. He was angry because they had turned his house into something he didn't want. So he claimed the temple as his house. Now, now with that being said, what are we? We are the temple of God. Not the building of God, but the building made without hands. That's who we are. We are now the temple of the living God. When, when uh, Paul wrote to the first, uh, in 1 Corinthians 3 and 16, What? Know you not 
that you are the temple of God? What does that mean? If the temple was the building God dwelled in, what are we? We are the temple He dwells in. Amen? You see the beauty of these scriptures and what these are telling us about things to come, things that He wants, and it ain't, oh, it, this is just the beginning, this is just a, a tip of the iceberg to what this tabernacle is going to show us about who Christ is to come. Amen? Just, it's just a tip. And, and, and then he says, he says, now, if we're going to build this tabernacle. We're going to build it. All of this stuff that you've given me. Now, at this moment, they didn't know how all this stuff was going to come together. And Troy, I can just see them while they're bringing all this stuff. And they're laying it down in these piles and these heaps. And they've got all these skins and they've got all this... This, this, this stuff and they got all these these uh this, this wood and they're, they're just piling things up and it's just a heap right there and, and and now somebody's got to figure out what am i going to do with all this stuff well god's going to tell them what they're going to do with it so he he tells them he said I'm, i want you to uh uh i'm going to show you after the pattern of the tabernacle and a pattern of listen to this all the instruments that go in it Amen? So not only did he want them to have a tabernacle, but he wanted, wanted them to have some things inside the tabernacle that he calls his instruments. Amen? Now what's an instrument for God? Mine says furnishings. It's a furnishing. Okay. It can be a furnishing. Do we have instruments in the church today? Anything you use for, anything you use for his glory. Yeah. I mean, we've got a fully stocked kitchen back there. That's instruments for God. The pen is an instrument for God. The pulpit is an instrument for God. This table is what you're sitting on is an instrument for God. Amen. Amen. We have our sound system, our video recorder, everything in here is an instrument for God. So God don't have a problem with us having instruments in here. Nor does he have a problem with it being nice stuff. Amen? And you don't have a problem with that. And look at all the, the list of stuff that he gave them. And you know that this was very precious and expensive stuff that he asked them to give him. Amen? And he's going to put this all together for his tent of dwelling where he's going to be. God expects us to do our best. Amen? And he expects us to give him his best. You don't believe me. You go back where we've already studied. And he said, I want your first fruit. I want the firstborn. I want your first children. I want your first animals. I want the best you've got. I want the first you've got. You pay me first and then. Without blemish. Yeah. And I want it to be perfect. That's right. And so that, that's what we have to understand about God. God don't mind us having nice stuff. As long as we don't make the nice stuff our God. Amen. I'm, I'm going to drop a, I'm gonna drop a bombshell in here right now. Y'all know how I'm, I'm, I'm mouthy sometimes. Our main work is not in this building. Our main work is out there. Amen. Now we can do all the work in here you want to. And I believe God rewards us for, for doing things. But our main work is out there with people. That's where it's at. So don't never forget that. Okay, so we got all these things that's going on. And, uh, and then he tells us, he said, now he's talking about these instruments. So he opens the door. The first thing he says I want you to build is called the Ark of the Testimony or the Ark of the Covenant, which is later going to be called. Somebody read for me verses 10 through 16, please. And they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof. And a cubic and a half the breadth. Therefore, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold within and without. Shalt thou overlay it and shalt make upon it a crown of gold 
a, a round bout. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof, and two rings shall be in the one side of it, and two rings in the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be born with them. The staves shall be in the ring of the ark, they shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I <coughs> shall give thee. Okay, so he says, I want you to make an ark. Does anybody know what the uh, uh, what the word ark means? Same place. Pardon? Same place. Not the actual Same meaning place. of it. Anybody else? I know I'm fishing. It means coffin. Coffin. The ark that Noah built was shaped like a coffin. The ark that, uh, that of the bulrushes that Moses was put in was a basket. This ark is also a box enclosed. And when you think about the description of it, it's not big enough to be a coffin except for maybe somebody very little. But it's got a way to carry it and transport it to the stage. And so the, the, uh, the ark is, is made of this shittim wood. And this, by the way, is, is not called that anywhere else uh, in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the area where they, they got all this stuff. And it still exists today as a wood called Achia wood. Or I don't know if that's even the way to pronounce it. Uh, but that's that's what it's it's called, and it's a uh, it's a a orange brown wood on the inside. It's got real thick bark. It and, and it's got an interesting characteristic that I, that I found out today as I looked at at the wood. That probably the reason God wanted to use this wood. Does anybody know what that characteristic is? It worked as an insect repellent. Bugs don't like it. It doesn't run. It's very, it's, it's very lasting wood. And so uh, he, he had them to build not only Noah's Ark out of this wood, but he had them to build the Ark of, of the uh, Testimony out of the same wood. Now, when he had this Ark made, he had it overlaid with what? Gold. And he, had, he told them how to build the legs. Now, the stays are poles that's made out of the same wood, and they are also overlaid with gold. And on the inside of each leg, there was, there was a hole uh, made of gold also that was attached to the legs that these staves slid through and went through all four legs. And so there was one on each side where when men carried it, they could lift it up and actually put it on their shoulders and that's the way they walked with the ark. And the, and the Bible says here that the staves were to never be pulled out. Now you'll find out later on in Scripture that that the, the there's going it's going to be behind the veil because this article is going to go into the holiest of holies, and this is the only article back there, the only instrument back there, and, the, <coughs> and and from from the way it was made, when you looked at the veil, the staves would be pushed in, not pushed out, but pushed all the way in where you couldn't see them sticking out from from the from outside the veil. And so this, this thing was 47 inches this way. I didn't bring my tape measure, but it Set was- a cube is from you. Tip of your finger to your elbow. Yeah, the cubit- It should be 18 inches. The cubit is from the, your elbow to the end of your finger. That was the uh, small cubit. And then it had a large cubit, and he's talking probably about the small cubit here, which is from your elbow to the tip of your finger plus a hand's breadth. That was a large cubit, okay? And so it, it figures about 18 inches. So that's where I got 47 by 27 by 27. And what is the symbol, some symbolism of the Ark of the Covenant, or the Ark of the Testimony? It's going to become very symbolic to them. 
What is the symbolism that God is even going to project it here? How, what is it? The presence of God. The presence of God. Okay. That's where he sits. Yeah. It's going to be the presence of God. And and uh, and it's not it's not going to go into great detail right now because he's just getting them to build the box. But later on, there's going to be some 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 other things that are going to be uh, put on on this uh, this art, and we'll see about that here in just a minute. But he said, I want you to overlay it with pure gold, and I want you to build a crown around the border of it. So they put they, they, this this is the edge, and they put a crown all the way around. Now everybody know what a crown is. It, it, a king's crown is what it is. It's ornamental, it's decorative, but it, it, is, it, it had a purpose for it. And it was to be on the outside of this and go all the way around it. Okay? And so that's what he told him. He said, I want it to be made of also of, of pure gold round about. And, and then he said, uh, he went on to tell him uh, about leaving the stage and all that stuff in there. And thou shalt put in it, in verse 16, uh, in the ark of the testimony, which uh, uh, the ark, the testimony which I shall give thee. Now he don't tell them that at this point exactly what he's going to ask them to put in there. Amen. The, but if you read in Hebrews in the in the New Testament, chapter nine, verse four, uh, the writer of Hebrews tells us this. He says, uh, and the, and the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden center. And the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, one of the uh, articles that we're going to go into it, uh, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Now that's what uh, later on was going to go inside of this ark. Amen. Now, there's a lot of controversy around the Ark of the Covenant. We don't really need to get into that right now. We will get into it at some other point because there's a lot of people who are still looking for the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. Amen? You know where they're going to find it? In heaven. The Bible tells us in Revelation 20, uh, chapter 21, verse 19, exactly where it is. Amen? So unless these, these treasure seekers go to heaven, they ain't going to never find it, y'all. Amen? Because that's where he says it is. Does anybody know when it disappeared? Solomon's temple was destroyed. When Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem, it was never seen or heard of again. Okay? So that's when it disappeared. And I think that's in 586 B.C. A long time ago. At the captivity. And so uh, uh, we, there's a lot of things about the ark but it's symbolic of the presence of God. And it too is going to become an idol in Israel before it's over with. Amen. Now can you imagine worshiping the pulpit? Let me give you a better one. Oh, it's getting quiet here now. There are so many people in the world today that have made this their idol. It's a cross. It's made out of wood. Amen? There's no power in this cross. There was only power in the one that hung on it. He is God. This is not. Amen? Amen? And so we have to be careful how we portray those things. Okay? What so, did you... What did you say at Revelation? Uh, Revelation chapter 11. I said 21. Chapter 11, verse 19. Look at it. I hope I got it wrote down right. You know I'm bad about writing the wrong thing down. But I think that's what it is. Chapter 11, verse 19. You want to read it for us? of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament and there were light, lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and okay. great hell. Okay, so up in heaven in the temple of God there was seen in his temple the ark of the testament. Amen. That's where it's at. Amen. And, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hell. Everything was going on around it but that's where it was at. That's where John the Revelator saw it. Amen. All right. 
Uh, any more questions about the, the uh, art of the testimony? Y'all, we're not near about through with this art of the testimony. We, we, this, this is only the beginning of, of the thing that we're going to learn about this thing. Okay? Uh, the next article is the mercy seat. Now, this is also a part of the art of the testimony. All right, somebody read for me verses 17 through 22, please. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on one end, and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another towards the mercy seat, shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and the ark shalt, thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commute with thee, from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandments unto the children of Israel. Okay. Now, you can see now why they said it was the presence of God. Now, he said, I want to put a mercy seat. Now, what is it about God's mercy? It endures forever. It's from everlasting to everlasting. God's mercy is without the end as God. Now, after saying words like that, does God's mercy know an end? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It knows an end. And if you go and read in Jeremiah, you'll see the end of it. And anyway, I don't want to get into that. But uh, but he so he says, I want you to make this this uh, this mercy seat, and, and it's going to be what size? It's going to be the same size uh, as the top of the holy uh, of the of the uh, ark of the testimony. Amen. It's going to fit inside of the crown, and it's not going to have be have any wood in it. It's going to be solid gold. Amen. It's going to be solid gold. That tells us something about the mercy of God, doesn't it? It's, it, it ain't got nothing but purity in it. The mercy of God does. It's something we all need, something we all desire, something we all need to beg Him for, ask Him for, seek mercy from Him, because I'm going to tell you, He is so holy and we're so sinful that, that it, 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 we have to have that mercy to even stand in His presence. We get that from Christ Jesus, by the way, the ability to stand in His presence. Anyway, this this, uh, this, uh, this 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 mercy seat sits inside the crown, and, and I can imagine how heavy that thing must have been. Solid gold. And they had to put that thing, probably got some fingers, man, mm -hmm. sitting mm -hmm. down in there. But they put it in there, and when they carried it, it could not fall mm -hmm. off. It didn't have holes in it. It wasn't attached in any way. It just sat in there, and that crown held it up there. Now he said, not only do I want you to put this mercy seat on top of there, I want you to put some things on top of the mercy seat. Yes, sir. I'm on that, that mercy seat. It gives you the length and the width. You don't say how thick it is, does it? Uh-uh. I never have seen it where it says how thick it is. Never have. I didn't see it here. Yeah. I wondered about that myself, but I couldn't find it. So maybe we'll find it one of these days. I'm sure some of these uh, Jewish theologians know exactly how thick it was. <laughs> The ones that are hunting it, probably. <laughs> if they would believe the Word of God, they'd know where it's at. Amen. They quit wasting their time. Anyway. And so he said, I want you to put these cherubims. Now, what are cherubims? They're angels of God, but they're not just angels. They're, uh, the Bible mentions two different distinct types of, of angels that are around the throne, and they are constrained looking characters. And they, he mentions the, the cherubim and the seraphim. Amen? And he mentions these angels right here. And these cherubims are, are placed on top of the mercy seat, on top of the uh, Ark of the Testament. And there's one on this end, and there's one on that end, and they're facing each other. 
and their wings are spread out and they're spread out over the mercy seat toward one another as they face one another. What do you think they're looking for? What do you think they're looking at? The same thing they do in Revelation where he talks about they're, they're there. They're consistently around the throne of God. Amen? And they're, they're there because this is where God will come. And, and it's going to tell us that here in just a minute. And he said, they shall look one to another toward the mercy seat, and, and, and their faces shall be toward each other. And then he looked, look at what he said. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark, and the ark thou shalt put uh, the testimony that I give thee. So he says, I'm going to give you some, some testimonies to put inside of this. He still hadn't told him what it was, but the second time he told him, I'm going to give you some stuff to put in this test, uh, uh, ark. And so he says, and, and look at verse 22, though. This is a very telling statement to us that he's telling to Moses. And there I will meet with you. Now let me ask you a question. Where has he met with Moses come on up till now? And still is. On this mountain. Okay? And there's some things that, that, that a lot of people may not know when you begin to read and study before this, this tabernacle was constructed was completed that there was a tent that was in the camp that was another place where God met with Moses. Amen? It was called the tent of meeting. And it was called that is because God met with Moses there. And he met with them him there and on several occasions we'll see later on where those people could see it and hear it. Amen? So there's always a place where God wants to meet with us. It's been on top of Sinai. It's going to be in, in the tent of meeting because he's not going to keep them at Sinai. They're fixing to start moving. And while they're moving, they're going to be under construction. Okay? Now, th th these are a unique people. God giving them special talents. And, he, and, and later on, we're going to see that he calls uh, a, a particular man and gives him the skill, the gift, to do everything that he lays out for. Isn't that wonderful that God can take a man and give him whatever he needs to make him accomplish everything God wants him to do? Amen? Y'all listen to me. He'll do every one of us that way. He will. He'll do every one of us that way. Amen. So he says, I'm going to meet with thee and I will commune with you there above the mercy seat between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So from now on, after you get all this done, from that point on, this is where we're going to meet. Amen? The presence of God. All right. So any questions about this, this, this uh, mercy seat? All right. Somebody read for me verses 23 through 30, please. That will be back. Thou shalt also make a table of children wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make a there to a crown of gold about. And thou shalt make unto it a border of a hand breadth round about, and thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. And thou shalt make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings in the four corners that are on the four feet thereof. Over against the border shall the rings be places for the stage to bear the table. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold, and the table may be born with them. And thou shalt make the dishes thereof, and spoons thereof, and coverings thereof, and bowls thereof, to cover with them, and of pure gold shalt thou make them. And thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me always. Okay, so here's another th uh, uh, article. Now this is not going into the holiest of holies. This this article here is going to be in the holy place, but uh, on one side of the veil. The holiest of holies is going to be on the other side of the veil. He hadn't mentioned the veil and all that yet, because he's still talking about these 
uh, these articles of furniture. This table is going to serve a specific purpose. Amen? And it's not there uh, for no particular reason. It's there for a specific reason. And, he, and it's 36 inches by 18 inches wide, 36 inches long, 18 inches wide, and it's 27 inches tall. It's overlaid with pure gold. It also has uh, rings on it with staves through it for everything, every article of this is going to be carried by people, which is going to be the Levites that would eventually is going to carry this. And, and, and so he, he says that uh, uh, everything is made out of shittim wood and it's overlaid with gold, just like uh, the, the uh, box of the ark is made. And it, then he said, I'm gonna, I want you to put dishes on there. Now, what kind of dishes do you think they're going to have? Ain't gonna be made out of gold, all right. But what what are what are these dishes? They're gonna have spoons. They're gonna have utensils. Is what he's talking about. Yes. Sir. I, I, why do you think this is not going in the? I think it's in the holy of the holy places. This and the lampstands are in the furnace. This is in the holy place, this not is, in the holiest of holies. This is in in this, the holiest of holies. This is in there with the ark. No. 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 The, the, why? Why do you say that? Because it, uh, you'll see later on uh, that it'll, it'll, it'll put the veil in there. But, the, they, but he says, and you will place this bread before me always. That's it, right. And, that, and that's where he's supposed to be, is in there with the ark. Uh, yeah, but the, the bread is placed before him like an offering to him and will be eaten by the Levites. And it's showbread is what it's called. And he even tells them how to do it. But when it... it you need to go up to uh, Eureka Springs and go through the New Jerusalem and go through that tabernacle. They've got a replica of the tabernacle built. So you can see this. It's a beautiful thing to see if it's still open. But when you walk into the tent, you, there's an outer court and there's a place of sacrifice. There's a brazen altar, the brazen labor, altar of sacrifice. All this is out in front, in the front courtyard. And then you walk into the place called the holy place. It's a, it's a separate room from the holiest of holies. It's separated by the veil. In the holy place, they, and, and, uh, right up next to the tent, there's an altar of incense, there's the, the table with the showbread on it, and there's the golden candlesticks that's on the other side. And, and when you look at it, it's, it makes a cross. It, it, boy, when you see the symbol, symbolism of all this, and you see the way the furniture is set in there, where God is the head, there's this veil, but it's all shaped like a big cross. It's beautiful. I've seen the pictures of it. It's just beautiful the way it's set up. So this place is called the holy place. Okay. The holiest of holies only, at this point, only Moses could go back there. And later on, the high priest would be the one that would go back there. Okay? Okay. So th this is where this table is at. And so uh, he said they, he puts this table there. It's got these dishes on there. It's got spoons and it's got covers and it's got bowls and all this stuff that goes there. And he said, thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me always. Now, when you, if you research this showbread and look at it, this is a bread that was made. And there's 12 loaves that's there. It's in the bowl that's in the middle of the table. Everything else revolves around it. And it's set up six and six. It's set up in two rows, six and six. And he made a special incense that he put between the bread. And the, the symbolism of the showbread is that it represents the 12 tribes of Israel. It also is there for the priests to eat. They had to eat this bread every week. And every week they had to put brand new bread there. Okay? They had to keep it updated. Keep brand new bread there. Now, I don't tell you this in the scripture right here. You, if you want to research it, research it. Look up showbread and study it. Yes, sir. I've got a question for you. Okay. I mean, we've already, we've already gone way past what I read a while ago. But verse, verse 9. 9? Yes, sir. According to all that I showed thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof. Whenever I, over in Exodus, or not Exodus, over in Hebrews, chapter 8. Uh, let's see. In Hebrews 8, verse 5, is, you know, whenever, I guess Moses was showing that pattern up on the mount. From yeah. The, from Hebrews, Hebrews 8, 5. God showed him the pattern whenever he is up on the mount. 
Yeah, he probably did give it to him up. He was, you remember, lad, when we left Moses, he was up there on the mountain 40 days, 40 nights. Have you ever have you ever heard about this pattern that he was showing that there was a pattern of a tabernacle in heaven? In uh, Hebrews 9, verse 11, it mentions that. Yeah. It is a, a pattern of the temple in heaven. But it says the temple's not there because God is the temple there. But the Ark of the Testimony is there. They call it the Ark of the Covenant in, in, in heaven. Yeah, I, I, I guess my question would be, whenever uh, whenever Moses showed this pattern of the tabernacle he was fit to build, was, was he seeing a tabernacle in heaven? I don't think so. I think he was writing all this down and taking down all these specific details. And, uh, because if you'll remember, let me see if I can back up and find that, uh, where the Lord told him to write. He's writing all this stuff down. Okay? Uh, in verse 4, chapter 24, he says that Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar. So he, he's writing all this stuff down, and when he goes back up, he's up there for... Man, because we, we, this kind of skips around. It makes it kind of hard to understand because in the end of verse 24 it says Moses was in the Mount 40 days and 40 nights. And then it goes right into this first chapter 25 where he's given out all these details and all these articles that he wants him to build. And at the first of it he, he, he tells him he wants these offerings that are to be made. Okay, So he, he's laying all this out for Moses to, uh, to do. Okay. Yeah. You have more questions about it? I mean, I don't. I can't tell you the. I don't know where Moses was to be honest with you. I just know that he had received this from God and was passing it on, and, and he's allowing us to see it also. And he said, uh, and, and talking about the shoe bread again. Uh, this is what I want to leave you with. And y'all, we're probably gonna stop here. I wish we'd gone in the candlestick. We're gonna stop here because this is gonna be too much in the candlestick. What I want you to understand about the show show bread that it is symbolism, the bread is a symbolic item for the New Testament. Does anybody know what that is? It's Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, chapter, uh, John uh, chapter 8, Jesus, uh, man, uh, I tell you what, just just read John chapter 8. It's full of the bread. <laughs> Amen. It, it's all about the bread. And, and Jesus wanted everybody to know uh, who he was, and, uh, and what, what he is to them. And y'all, Jesus uses a lot of symbolism to describe who he is. You know why? Because he is all in all. He, he's all of it. All of the fullness of the Godhead is in him. Everything about God is Jesus Christ. So he, just the bread is just one symbol of who he is. And and when he, he says in, in John chapter 8, verse 12, he says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He, uh oh, I'm in the wrong one now. I was supposed to be doing the bread. Let me see what I wrote, I wrote the bread down. Uh, uh, John 6 and 48, excuse me. I, I done skipped across the candlestick. So y'all know where I'm going to go with the candlestick there next time. Uh, <laughs> but John, John chapter 6 is the one that talks about uh, uh, so much about the bread. And in, in uh, verse uh, uh, let's see, 48, uh, he said, Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness, and are dead. There is bread which cometh down from, from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. In verse 48, he says, I am the bread of life. Amen. I'm the bread of life. And, and when, you, when you have this bread, he said that I am the manna that came down from heaven. I am this bread that you have to have to be sustained, that you have to have to get through the wilderness until you get to the promised land. You remember when the last time they ate manna was? The day they went, decided to go over the Jordan to fight the Bible said they ate the manna and it never showed up again. Y'all listen to me. We're going to have to have the bread, Jesus, every day. 
all the time until we cross over to that promised land that he's promised us. There ain't a time we don't need him. We need him to sustain us and give us our energy. And we get that from him because he is that bread that feeds us and sustains us. Any comments? You know, you talk about the that ark being heavy. It must take about eight men to, to move that line. I figured about two, probably two on each arm of it. If I'm not mistaken, it was only four men that carried it. Really? Well, if I'm not mistaken, but I don't know that. Now they had it on their shoulders. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And now the uh, the uh, brazen, uh, the altar of sacrifice. Woo! Now they had to carry the fire for that thing around with them. <coughs> Amen? <laughs> they had to tote the fire. And he had specific people. When he builds this thing, they construct it. And before it's over with, he's going to have the Levites are going to be taking care of this tabernacle. That's their job from this point on. They don't even get an inheritance of land when they get to the promised land because their job is to take care of the tabernacle and later on the temple. They have specific duties. They had specific roles to take, build it up and to tear it down. They, they were the rig builders and the rig tear downers. Amen. They were the crew that did that. And the only time anybody besides the priest went behind the holiest of holies, they took that veil down and then they got to go in there and remove that thing. And it was only because God had designated them to do that. Nobody else was allowed to do that. One guy did. He reached out. And oh, yeah. Him. One guy did. And uh, he, he reached out. Well, they were all in a mess at that time anyway. That was, uh, what was that guy's name? Yusa. Yusa was his name. I even remember the name of the guy that was driving the car. A how was his name. Wow. Yeah, well, I'm smart, ain't he? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he reached out to study that card, and I killed him graveyard that and made David mad. I was reading a guy that's a little, and he can he can get carried away sometime. I have to I have to keep that in mind. And it gets so bogged down, it gets complicated. But he was showing symbolic in this ark, and he even went as far as the wood being overlaid by gold. You know, and, and, the, and the top being pure gold, that the wood was us, and the gold, the pure gold, is, is, was Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that um, that's how it's structured until he gets to the mercy seat. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's pure gold. Yeah. And that's where the sacrifice will be. Oh, yeah, you could spend, like, oh, yeah. I mean, I never dreamed we would get through this chapter tonight, but here we are, we didn't. Well, you got to have a better mind than me because he starts moving around so much, and then I get to wandering off from there, and I move around that much, so it's but, easy but to this get This is just the highlight of the instruments that are there. This ain't, he ain't got started into the, oh, my goodness, the all the wood that goes up and the different layers of the skins and everything and where each color goes. It, it's amazing. Every bit of its symbolism. I don't know where I'm smart enough to describe all that to you or not. I really don't. And I don't know where any of us have got the time to study it to, to do it. So y'all study it together and we'll all just kind of pitch in. Got a PowerPoint on, on it. And, you know, it has to be put up in a certain order and it has to be taken down in a certain order. The, 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 the scarves on the fence around the side have to be folded a certain way, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's a big deal. It's Even a big the deal. Like when you're talking about moving the, the millions of people and you, your, your Levi's are, are taking down the temple or the, the tabernacle, it's, you know. And a lot of it was way too heavy to be carried on shoulders, so they had a, a, a specific Levite family that had carts and donkeys and oxen to set this stuff on to haul it. And they were the, that's all their job was. That you get the heavy stuff and you haul it and you unload the heavy stuff. And that's that's so amazing. Their job. All the things that were that were sewn together and you know the material and the curtain and all that, you know, they didn't have sewing machines. They just you know, everything basically was done by hand by hand. Yeah. And that they had to make their own molds to do the 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 gold and Mm -hmm. you know, I have read the curtain that divided the Holy of Holies from the Holy Place. It, it, it had to be made by virgins. It was four inches thick. Yeah, it was humongous. Yeah. Even the people, you know, they didn't get
get up and drink coffee and slip on their rib wings and go coat the ark. They had a lot of things to do to Ooh. get that close to that ark. You better believe it. And they had to be moved when the Lord told them it's time to go. They had to tear that thing down and go. And then when he said stop, they had to put it back together again. Right, right then. And guess where the tabernacle of God was in the camp? In the very center. In the very center. And he had an equal number of tribes on the north, an equal tribe, number of tribes on the south, an equal number of tribes on the east and west. And he designated which tribes went where. And, and when, when I saw a picture of that one, and it looked like a cross as they traveled. And as they set up their camp and it showed the different uh, areas of it, it was, it was symbolic of a cross also. It's crazy. Well, where the furniture is all placed inside the tabernacle, yeah. it's like a cross. Yeah. Anyway, no, we, we, we could talk about this. I could go on all night with this stuff and still wouldn't make a dent in it. So uh, we just take our time and keep studying, and, and our hour up. Sounds and, like they had a lot of gold about it. Well, they, they had ro robbed Egypt. No, they didn't rob it. They just, uh, everything got gave to them. They had a lot of gold and silver and and uh, they had mirrors, they had everything. They had all these precious jewels. They had every bit of this, they had it. And it came from Egypt. Uh, My Bible actually has a, a picture of that ark. And as you were describing all of that, it's, it's exactly like what you were describing out of there. Ain't I smart? <laughs> oh, Lord. The thing about it is, I got that same picture in mind. So. <laughs> I <laughs> <laughs> uh, we just saying, I love y'all. This is I love these Bible studies, and I hope y'all are enjoying them. And I hope you're learning. The the main thing is that we learn this together, and to realize that God has always been the same. He's always made the provision, and He has looked forward to the time of Christ, the promise that He made to Abraham that in, in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. He looks beyond that. Amen? He looks beyond that to the time of the Gentiles. He looks beyond that to the fulfilling of the nation of Israel on this earth. And we get to come back with Jesus all glorious day. Amen? What a glorious time. It's something that for us to all rejoice in and look forward to. Amen. God bless you. Brother Gary Ripson, would you dismiss us, please? Heavenly Father, we, we thank you, Lord, that we can come here and study your word and, and be here with fellow Christians and, and learn about you and, and your story, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, that that you sent Jesus here to, to shed light for us and, and instruct us. And, and we just thank you, Lord, for all that you do. We uh, pray that you'll be with those that are on our prayer list. We pray that you'll be with those that uh, Miss Hefflin and, and those that couldn't come this evening. We just uh, pray that you'll watch over and protect each one here. Please thank you for asking Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.